Hello everybody, and welcome to a new episode of Gaming in the Wild, a video games podcast about games from the artistic, creative side of the tracks, from indie to AAA. My name's John, I'm your host, I'm recording out here in Reykjavik, Iceland, on the 2nd of September, it's a Saturday afternoon, um, and I've been, I've been playing some Starfield today, man, it's here. Um, this has been a, a big period for uh, video game releases, it seems like. We've had Sea of Stars, I've played a little bit of that, that one's coming really high on the, uh, the critical response. Um, Starfield is in early access, I was going to wait for it on Game Pass, but I ended up caving, having listened to some people talking about it, having talked to a colleague at work who was evangelizing about it, I thought, I've got this weekend ahead of me, I think I need to weigh in, uh, get into this game, I really want to play it, and so I paid for the early access and I've been playing a little bit of Starfield. So before we get to the main review today, I'm going to offer um, some first impressions on both of those games. They're both highly anticipated games, and I've had fun with both of them. Um, I'm also going to give a full review to Fort Solace, so that'll be the featured game of this episode. This is another third-person cinematic sci-fi adventure. You may have seen this one around on the, uh, the Summer Games Festival's circuit with Troy Baker and uh, that chap who played Arthur Morgan in uh, Red Dead 2. So it's got some pretty hefty voice actors in it. It's an interesting game. Um, I spent quite a lot of time thinking about how I would talk about this game. It's got some big strengths, it's got some big drawbacks. Um, certainly an interesting one, more interesting than I, was, than I was expecting in some ways. So the featured game of this episode will be Fort Solace. But before we get to that, let's start off with some first impressions of Sea of Stars and Starfield. So Sea of Stars, you've probably seen this one around. It's been um, doing the rounds on social media. It's been um, passing the eye test for a lot of people. It's a beautiful top-down pixel art adventure game in the old um, turn-based JRPG style, in the Chrono Trigger style. It has a big Chrono Trigger influence in it. Um, the art is just absolutely gorgeous in this one. Um, not only does it have beautiful uh, characterizations in pixel art, which I know is a style a lot of people really love, but it it has some really nice effects in it as well, which I was surprised by playing the opening section of this game, uh, where you start as a pair of young um, soldiers, I guess, uh, fighting a strange war in a, a magical kingdom. Um, but th the game actually begins much before that, so you flash back to their origin story at the start of the game, uh, you have to go through magic school. It's quite a short section. Um, I'd say it takes about an hour to get through. And I have just gotten to the time skip where you flash back to the present day. Um, and the look of this game is really something, actually. When you're in the magic school in a, a tower high up in the clouds, it has beautiful um, weather effects and light effects. Um, it does some ingenious stuff with shadows. Um, there's one great scene where you come into an inn and the innkeeper is standing in front of a roaring fireplace. And there's quite a crafty little pixel art shadow system, so as you walk to the fire, it casts shadows behind you in a way that is impressive. It's a little bit of sleight of hand. I don't think these are um, polygonal objects that have been rendered and then put into a pixel art style. It looks more like pixel art sleight of hand, but it was really cool. Um, so I've constantly been engaged by the look of this game, and it, it plays well too. Um, the combat system is turn-based, but very intuitive. It has a great mixture of um, melee attacks where you can swing at an enemy and if you hit the button just at the right time in your swing you get an extra attack. Um, you can also do some magic attacks where you throw a projectile at an enemy, it bounces off them and then you can kind of play ping pong with it and bounce it back and back and back onto that enemy in a speeding up little action mini game. Um, you can also parry if you time it well, so although it is turn-based, it has a very engaging action element to the combat as well. Um, the writing is very much of that genre, so it's pretty straightforward stuff, straightforward dialogue, um, straightforward characters, but they have beautiful little pixel art portraits that flash up on the screen whilst they're speaking. Um, there is an overworld map, there are various areas to explore, uh, bosses, enemies, loot to find, lots of traditional uh, top-down puzzles, so you're using switches to raise platforms, you are lighting torches to open the way forward, that kind of thing. Um, I think for fans of that genre, um, they're going to love this game. It, it has scored very well, actually. I think it overperformed what people were expecting. It has a Metacritic score of 90, an Open Critic score of 89, so it's a really high-scoring game, and I can see why. Um, my first impressions of Sea of Stars are that it's an accomplished game of this genre. 
um, and the people that love Chrono Trigger, Secret of Mana, all of those kind of games, old Final Fantasy, are really going to lap that one up. Um, but I don't think Sea of Stars, despite this great first impression, is going to be the game that I am playing the most of over the coming weeks, because um, Starfield is also here, the long-awaited uh, Bethesda first-person, although you can flip to third, actually, like in Fallout, um, Space Odyssey. Um, this game is finally here, and there has been something of a, a fraught discourse about this game online. It's a little over the top, honestly. Um, all of the, the console warriors are out in force. Um, all the Sony people are mocking the game. All of the Xbox people are tearing into any critic who dares to say anything bad about it online. It's all pretty toxic and gross, but we just sweep all of that shit to the side here on Gaming in the Wild, and we just talk about the games. Um, so Starfield is a game that I was just going to play on Game Pass, but you can pay £30 to get this deluxe edition, which allows you to play it a week in advance, and you get some extra outfits and that sort of thing. So I just took the plunge, I paid that money, um, I downloaded Starfield, and before I recorded today, I thought I will start my day with a nice hour of Starfield, just to get my head into it, just to see what it's all about. Um, I ended up playing it for three hours, so I'm three hours into the game. I have played the introductory section, which in a classic Bethesda style, uh, much like the start of Skyrim with that famous cart ride and dragon attack, and Fallout with the uh, the time skip and the time capsule, sort of cinematic opening that sets the stage. Starfield begins similarly. Um, you are going down into a mine on a distant moon somewhere in this this Starfield universe. It's set in the year... 2330, so 2330, 300 years in the future from now. Um, and it starts with this beautiful cinematic sequence, actually. I was very immediately taken with the look and the feel and the vibe of Starfield. It has the most lovely visual style, actually. The way that the, the graphics are treated, there is a lot of detail on every costume, on every rock, on every machine. Um, the world is very, very populated with stuff. There are panels everywhere, computer panels everywhere. You go down an industrial lift into the depths of this mine um, with a guide who is introducing you to the job as a miner. You are a miner. And before you know it, you are running around this mine. There are people using cutters to carve into the rock and sparks flying. The light has a very dusty brown quality to it. And it uses film grain very well. Um, the textures are really, really detailed. Everything looked very crisp. Um, there was some controversy about the frame rate of this game, but it's a 30 FPS game. Um, it looks absolutely gorgeous. I did not notice the frame rate. It was solid. Um, so it technically performed really well. Um, I love the art style. Um, the music is just fantastic. It has this Star Wars style orchestral sweep to the whole thing. Um, and if you put all of this together, what you get is an incredibly strong mood. Um, it's the first thing that really got me about Starfield is the atmosphere is fantastic. It has this optimistic, sweeping, space-age feel to it. Um, they are calling it NASA punk. I'm um, not quite sure that there's much punk here. Uh, there's quite a lot of NASA. Uh, not much punk, but um, the, the graphic design in this game is really cool. Like all of the logos you see, all of the uniforms, all of the uh, insignias. Uh, when you go into terminals, you will see beautiful, crisp, uh, contemporary clean UI that you use to read logs and um, gain key codes and all of that stuff that we see in games. And the whole thing hangs together great. It has a really, really strong vibe to it. Um, I really enjoyed that first mind sequence. I felt like I was taking my first step into a really epic world, um, into a fully realized universe that has a strong vision behind it. Um, after that, you find an artifact, like a space artifact that has uh, gives you a kind of a vision um, and I had my speakers blasted up nice and loud, and I was playing it on a nice big monitor with the lights low. And when you have that vision, you kind of flash through the universe and see space clouds. Um, the music swells, the sound goes really loud. Um, and I just got this big grin on my face. I got goosebumps, and I was like, oh, God, yeah, they've done it. This is great. So it looks amazing. It feels amazing. Uh, before long, you are given a ship, and you are sent out into the universe. You've become swept up in a bigger plot line than your simple minor life. Um, and the ship itself is also beautiful. It's such a cool design, bulky and industrial from the outside, but inside it feels lived in. There is like a dining table with snacks on it. 
There are ornaments on the shelves. There are blinking panels that you can go and examine. Um, a sleeping area, like a bunk in the side of the ship. It's cosy. Um, and it has that lived-in universe feel that I think Star Wars pioneered, where nothing is clean, everything's a bit grimy, but it all just looks great. It's crisp, it's attractive. Um, every time you look around, you're getting environmental storytelling. You're picking up little details of how this ship is constructed and um, how it's a mixture of clean, factory-designed space travel, but also slightly patched together with cables kind of tied up on the walls um, and with desks with things lying around on them, with jump seats for various uh, crew members to sit in as the ship travels through space. Um, And I felt at home in the ship straight away, which I think is very important in a game like this too, to have a sense of place. Um, The characters that I met, I was quite impressed by. Uh, One of my fears about this game was the plasticky looking faces, which I think Bethesda are famous for, these stiff mannequin-like characters. Um, But actually, they're pretty good. The voice acting is great. The faces have a lot of character. They're quite expressive, Uh, more expressive than I thought at least. And there are some really cool moments for the characters too. Like if you're standing in a ship talking to people and then you're about to go out into the vacuum, then they will pull on helmets. The helmets click on and lights light up inside the helmet and it illuminates their face in a really, really cool way. Um, I think like we saw in Callisto Protocol, um, where the faces are illuminated by in-helmet lighting. And it just gives it a really strong feel. I think the film grain actually adds an awful lot to it. It feels cinematic and it's just vibey. It feels big. There is a sense of the epic in this game. And it really felt like the start of a big adventure. Um, So after that, you do a little space pirate base attack. You do a little bit of space combat. And that's basically where I am up to. Um, it's not all good, I have to say. There are a couple of negatives that I do want to call out, even in my first impressions. Um, there is some jank, you know. There's been a lot of talk about Bethesda, the way they make games, how they have physics, they have packed worlds, they have lots of possibility in their worlds, and therefore all of these possibilities lead to uh, bugs because there's just so much going on in these environments. Um, The reviews have said that it's pretty clean. Um, That is not my experience. I encountered two major bugs in the first base assault. Uh, One was replicable. It was a reproducible bug where at some point in the space station, when you're shooting space pirates and looking for this captain that you have to kill so they don't follow you through the universe, um, I just fell through the floor. I fell straight through the floor um, into the void, into the backstage area of the game. To its credit, the game did reset and take me back into the environment that I was supposed to be in, Um, but then I I immediately fell again. And I left the base at one point and came back in just to see if it was a bug that would just vanish. But no, in that same spot, whilst walking through the the golden path of the game, in the very first mission of the game, there is a place where you fall through the ground and the game comes apart at the seams a little bit. Um, There was another bug where the robot companion I have with me, who is incredibly cool, he's like a Star Wars-esque bipedal robot. He will fight with you, he will talk to you. He has a really cool robotic voice. He can carry things for you. Um, It's a great companion system, like Fallout again. Uh, But he has a very loud machine gun, and at one point he fired it, and then the sound just continued. It was deafening. It drowned out all of the other sound in the game. It just didn't stop. I had to um, walk backwards through the entire base, leave loading screen out into the world, turn around, come back into the base, and then that sound stopped. So two pretty major bugs in the first base attack. Um, I'm hoping that that's just me. I did watch the Digital Foundry review, and they reported a clean, bug-free game. So I'm really hoping that that was just a blip um, and that the game will be clean. A couple other criticisms. The inventory system it is old-fashioned Bethesda. It fills up immediately. If you walk around shooting space pirates, looting their weapons, picking up interesting looking things from the environment, and the environment is loaded with things. There are clipboards, ashtrays, table ornaments, drinking glasses, syringes, everything in the world is pick up a ball. Um, You just fill your inventory immediately, and this is a solved problem in games, I think. When I was playing Horizon Forbidden West, I was very, very pleased to find that the game solved it. So Aloy has an overflow to her inventory. If your inventory is full, things are famously sent to your stash. Um, And we've mocked Aloy a little bit for constantly saying, hmm, my inventory's full, I'm going to send this to my stash. 
It's a piece of dialogue that you will hear hundreds or thousands of times as you're playing through Horizon. But here we are again, back in a Bethesda game. It does not have an overflow, and you are immediately full. You're encumbered, um, and you suffer if you're encumbered. Your health goes down eventually. Your suit fills up with CO2 or something. You can still walk quickly, which is great, so you don't get that encumbered, bulky, slow walk, which is just a mood killer. But it did mean that in that first base assault, I had to stop, look through my inventory, drop like a bunch of axes that I had looted off of bandits, uh, drop some guns. I'd been picking up all of the guns to sell because they are valuable. Drop some ephemera that I had just picked up whilst wandering around. And then all of it just shoots out of your character and lands on the floor in a big pile. If you've played Fallout, if you've played Skyrim, you'll be very familiar with this. But what you really don't want in a base assault is to be pulled out of the experience and to have to spend a minute or two or three sorting through stuff in a menu and then unrealistically jettisoning it all into the world before you continue on your way. So why, why, why Bethesda? Why have you just gone back to the old broken inventory system and not fixed it? The problem has been solved by other studios. Just have an overflow, man. Just send it to your stash. Um, but no, not in, not in this game. Um, there are a lot of loading screens. Every time you enter or exit your spaceship, you can't cleanly walk out. Um, every time you enter or exit a building, um, you'll get a loading screen. It feels old as a result of that. You know, we're used to open worlds where you can walk around the entire world that load in and jettison data, the modern AAA uh, way of loading games to give you a seamless experience. Not the case in Starfield. You're going to be seeing a lot of loading screens and they're not quick, despite the SSD. They're not like two seconds and in, which would be fine. I think of the recent Final Fantasy 16, which had loading screens, but it was just a fade to black and then back into the game. It was so fast that it read just as an edit, a cut uh, from a cutscene into game. It was a loading screen, but it was so rapid that no loading screen was required. It was just a very fast load. Here, you get a full-on graphic screen with a little loading icon. Could have done without that, man. That feels so old at this point. Uh, my final criticism, I don't want to lay into it too much, but um, I think one of the big draws of Starfield is this optimistic, expansive, exploring the universe vibe. Um, and when you get your ship, you're so happy, but you get into the cockpit, you hit a button to take off, and then you watch an animation of the ship taking off, leaving the atmosphere, and then you cut to space. Um, we've played No Man's Sky. We know that you can do seamless transitions and pilot your ship. Um, in this game, you don't really get to pilot your ship. Um, you do get to go around in space a little bit, but you're in a tiny little pocket of space. If you go towards a, a planet or a moon, um, you can't approach it. You can't get closer to it. You can't actually pilot your ship between planets and moons. Um, you just get this like little holding area where you do a little bit of dogfighting, a little bit of uh, resources. Then you have to go into a menu, um, select a planet on a map, and fast travel there. So in this big game about exploring space you don't actually get to explore space. Um, and I know that one of the big pushbacks on this critique is that you can't want it to be No Man's Sky. Um, and I don't. I don't want it to be another game. But I would say that in this game, and with this game's identity, and with the the sell of this game, the pitch for this game, explore a limitless universe, get out there into the star field, it feels like a huge omission that you don't get to feel free in space to travel the stars you in, instead, that is reduced to a little bit of menu management, um, looking at a map, clicking on a planet, and suddenly you're there. And then even if you come out of orbit, um, out of uh, jump rather, and you're near that planet, you can't fly down and land on it. You have to go into another menu, and then you just cut to a landing sequence. So this feels like a, a big disappointment to me. Um, the wonder of space travel, the openness of the universe is not present. It ends up being reduced to menu management and cutscenes, uh, which is a big mistake. So some positives there. I mean, I absolutely love the look, the feel, the voice acting, the universe. I like the combat. It's snappy and cool, basic gunplay. I love the environment. I'm very excited for my adventure. Um, but right off the bat, there are some items on this design document for this game that feel like immediate missteps in terms of the um, the holistic um, space exploration feel that we've all been so excited about. So that's where I'm at with Starfield. That's impressions after three hours of play, um, just takes on the first experiences of some of these systems. Um, and I don't want to be down on the game. I am really liking it. 
Uh, but I am really, really sad about the, some of the things that I've mentioned, some of the unsolved problems, um, some of the choices that have been made. But I can't wait to finish up this podcast and get back to the game, actually. Um, I meant to play one hour. I ended up playing three. And I, I think I'm going to spend the whole weekend playing it. Um, I think there's a big city coming up immediately for me now that I've finished that first combat mission. Um, so I will be getting back to Starfield right after this show. And I will be talking about it again next week, I am sure. And just before we get into the featured game of the podcast, the Fort Solace Review, let me mention, this is a patron-supported show. I would like to say a big thank you to the show's latest patron, Cousin Jack, who uh, signed up last week. It's the 48th patron of the show. Uh, The number goes up and down a little bit, you know, people join, people leave, and that's all fine. I really appreciate anyone that throws a couple of bucks my way. Um, All of that money that I get from the Patreon goes back into the show, into equipment, into the music that I use, um, into the costs of running a podcast. Um, and it helps to make the podcast sound better and be better. So thank you very much to Cousin Jack for signing up. The rewards that Cousin Jack will get and that you will get if you decide to sign up yourself for the Patreon is 10 bonus episodes about off-topic things, about literature, about music, about video game music, a couple deep dives. There is um, a, let me think, a Stanley Parable spoiler cast back there as well. I have uh, more bonus episodes coming this year. There will be um, an annual roundup of the best video game music of this year, towards the end of the year, and a few more in the works as well. So if you would like to sign up, join the Discord, which is for patrons only, and is a really nice place to hang out and talk about games, and get those bonus episodes, it's patreon.com slash gaminginthewild. I will put a link in the description. Big thank you to all my existing patrons, and a big thank you to you if you would like to support this show. Um, Also, thanks very much to people that have been leaving star ratings on Spotify. You can rate podcasts out of five. Um, We've been getting more and more ratings, and that helps other people to find the show. Big thank you to everyone that leaves a few words and a star rating on Apple Podcasts. That helps people find the show too. So thanks very much. That's all of the different ways that you can support this podcast. I appreciate all of it. It um, gives me a good mood every time I get a new Patreon or I see people leaving kind words about the show online. It's all great. So thanks very much for all of that. And with all of that said, let's move on and talk about the featured game of this episode, Fort Solace. So Fort Solace is a game that came out this year. It is developed by Fallen Leaf and published by Dear Villagers. It's available for PC and for PlayStation 5. I played it on my PlayStation 5. I felt like it ran very, very well. It's an impressive game to look at. It's a a visual showpiece, really. Um, I guess it's one of those double A games in that Senua's Sacrifice or Control kind of vibe. Um, Or Kena, Bridge of Spirits. One of those more ambitious indie titles that seems to be from a studio with uh, with big ambitions, and you can see that on the screen. Um, it has a Metacritic score of 63, which is quite low. Um, it's got quite a big spread on it. Gaming Bolt gave it an 80 and said, Though it's light on gameplay, Fort Solace is an accomplished narrative experience with a compelling story, an atmospheric setting, and excellent acting performances. Um, Game Reactor in the UK gave it a 50. That was one of the lower ones. Um, Even they praised the look. They said it's an atmospheric experience with impressive graphics and a slow but interesting narrative. But as a game, it falls short on many parameters with low interactivity, uh, quick time events and exploration that rarely feels rewarding. Um, I have sympathy, as usual, when I read out the, the high and low reviews, just to get a sense of what people thought of this game. I always find that very interesting, you know. Um, As a former journalist myself and someone who has been critiquing stuff for a long time, I love reading people's opinions. I love hearing what different people have to say and getting all of those different takes. It helps me to get my own thoughts in order. So I think that both of those journalists have have a good point. It does look great. Um, The gameplay is not the strong point. And I will be getting into uh, why I think that both of those takes are fine um, in my review. Um, It's a short game, this one. How long to beat has it? It's four to six hours. Um, There is a handful of side stuff that you can do. There is a little bit of optional backtracking. Um, And I think that uh, where you come in on that scale will depend a little bit on how well you orientate yourself within Fort Solace, this space station, or rather this planetary encampment on Mars. Um, I came in at about 4.5 hours. Um, I did a little bit of side stuff, but I did find out later on 
I had missed a few video logs, disappointingly. I thought I had been um, quite completionist because I wanted to find every story breadcrumb that I could. Um, but I watched a video afterwards and realized that I'd missed a couple quite important ones. So there must be a few little office rooms that I didn't find my way into. And the developers described this game by saying that it's a single player third person thriller set on the far side of Mars. Engineer Jack Leary responds to a routine alarm at Fort Solace and finds the outpost to be unnervingly dormant. As the night grows longer, events begin to unravel and spiral out of control. And I have to say of this one that Fort Solace is an atmospheric visual showpiece set on the Red Planet. It ramps up the tension masterfully in the opening stages and has an interesting human story to tell, but it's held back by some ambiguous narrative choices and obligatory feeling gameplay. Yeah, so this this is an interesting one to think about. Um, I will say that I, I went on a bit of a roller coaster with my my general takeaway of how I was feeling about this game. I had no plans to buy it, actually. I was vaguely interested just as a fan of sci-fi, and especially sci-fi and suspense. I really like that. I love a good science fiction environment to explore. Um, I love walking around environments that look nice and are juicy and interesting and well put together. So Fort Solace definitely looks the part, um, but it didn't really sell me from the things that I had seen. Like, I couldn't quite tell what it was. Like, is it a dead space? Is it, what is the game exactly? Um, but I was very happy to see that at the top tier of PlayStation Plus, you can get game trials where you get to play an hour or two of a game. Um, Fort Solace had a trial, so I tried it out. Um, the first hour of this game is rock solid. It's really, really cool. Um, and I was just getting deeper into the mystery. Um, and so the trial worked. I bought the game immediately and I played it in one sitting. But by the end of the game, I was rolling my eyes a little bit at some of the story decisions. And I came away feeling very unsatisfied by what I had played. I then went and watched a couple of spoiler videos where people talked through their own plot theories, filled in some of the blanks that I had missed during my playthrough. Um, and it sat in my mind for a good few days, and I was thinking about this story. It kept coming back to me, um, just trying to put those pieces together, trying to understand the things that aren't said, um, and trying to interpret the information that the game gives you. Um, you'll see a lot of logs in this game. You'll see a lot of emails in this game. A lot of the story is told through checking out terminals, looking at video messages. And so it's all a little bit fractured and disparate, and it does ask the player to... Um, exercise their own brain and put this story together, perhaps to a fault, um, in my opinion, but it was good enough that it stuck in my mind after I had played it. Um, and so I was really hot on it at the start. I was really cold on it at the end. Um, and after a few days of thinking about this game, I came out somewhere in between. I probably look back on it more fondly and think of it more highly than I thought I would after credits. I thought I might, you know, be pretty down on this one, but it's ambitious, it doesn't pull everything off, but it tries to do something really interesting, and so it's an interesting one to review for sure. Um, but let's start with an overview and a look at the scenario of Fort Solace. What is this game? It is a cinematic third-person adventure game in four chapters, so you're going to be looking at the back of your character, you're going to be walking around um, exteriors on Mars, interiors, including the titular Fort Solace, which is a big, heavy, chunky industrial installation, uh, with living quarters and recreation spaces and, you know, factory environments, machine storage, all of that kind of stuff. And it is absolutely beautiful. Um, you're going to be walking around this at a very slow pace, unfortunately, uh, which is one of the big critiques people have leveled at the game. It is something of a walking simulator. And um, when I say that, I never use that term pejoratively because I don't mind a walking simulator, honestly. I like to move through an environment and just take it in and think about what I'm seeing and let the vibe seep into me. I don't have to be you know, hitting buttons constantly to enjoy a game. So Walking Simulator is not a slight to me, um, but if it is to you, then maybe Fort Solace isn't for you. It's it's quite a passive gameplay experience. Um, what there is in terms of gameplay, um, there is some very light puzzling. For example, when you first rock up to Fort Solace, you have to find your way in. It's all pretty um, signposted, um, but there are times when you have to find key cards of different security strengths, uh, security levels rather. You have to find batteries, plug them into doors to make them open. You have to flick switches to make stuff happen. You have to like find a code on a whiteboard and punch it into a computer. So very light puzzling. I never got stuck. I just flew through it. Um, didn't have any trouble with any of that stuff. It was just 
in the way, you know, so it's what you do to move forward. Most of it actually, I thought, fitted diegetically into the story. Um, if you are coming into a locked down um, encampment or a locked down facility, you are going to have to find your way further in. So it, it worked well enough. It was very familiar gameplay, you know, key cards and batteries and switches is you can't get more cliched than that for games really, but the way that it worked with the story I thought was good enough for me. I didn't feel, um, it didn't snap me out of the narrative experience to be doing these things. It felt right to be doing them. Um, and the story is told largely through environmental storytelling as you explore. So you get a sense of what Fort Solace is as you are walking around it, looking at the details, um, looking at the lives of the people that are strangely absent uh, from this facility. Um, and you'll spend a lot of time discovering logs. Um, I think some people are allergic to logs. I'm not. Like, I quite like it. Like, um, people are pretty critical of Horizon Zero Dawn for telling most of its story through um, holograms that talk to you. I was actually fine with it. I just sat back in my chair, took a sip of my drink, um, and watched it quite happily before going back into the game. So um, I quite like the way the logs work in this game. If you come to someone's office, you'll find some of their personal effects. There is a sense of people being absent, which I really like. You will see like a mug that has been half drunk. You will see a coat hanging on a hook. And when you look at their workstations, if you can get into them, you'll find their emails, which you can read. They're all short and punchy and tell you interesting stuff. If you are a sleuth, you can look at the, the dates they were sent. You may see both sides of these email exchanges with supplementary material from the other parties involved, like who forwarded what to what, what was really going on behind the scenes. Um, I didn't sleuth it out. I just absorbed it all and went on my way. Um, but my favorite thing was the video logs. So people do two camera diaries, uh, messages that they are sending back to Earth, um, just diaries for themselves. There is a, um, a health officer at Fort Solace who encourages people to vent their feelings to camera in order to get them out. Um, and so you can find all of these video logs that the various crew members have left. Um, and as you start to listen to the different voices and find out about the interpersonal strife, the, uh, the work tension... Um, and the general kind of um, stir-craziness of this crew, um, you will figure out some interesting interpersonal relationships. Um, and as you are watching video logs, you will see the back of Jack Leary leaning over the monitor. Um, you're watching them in-game, so you're actually looking at them play on a monitor. So you're with Jack as he, inter as he interprets and internalizes all of this info. It's not like it flashes to a menu and then you get the video. The videos are all in-game. You can also watch them on Jack's uh, wrist piece, wrist computer, like a giant Apple Watch. So sometimes you're watching them on, on his wristwatch as well. So it's all very in-game, um, and I really liked that. So I had no beef with the text, the audio, and the video logs. Um, I will say that overall, this is not much of a dead space. It might look like it in terms of the graphics, like creeping around space stations with a torch in a big bulky suit with a helmet on. Like, it sure does bring to mind Dead Space, but in terms of what you're doing in gameplay, it might be more akin to something like a Gone Home. <laughs> it's maybe somewhere like somewhere between Gone Home and Dead Space, you will find um, the mood and the gameplay of Fort Solace. Um, and the game has a really excellent beginning, actually. So the scenario is that you are a maintenance engineer on the Red Planet, a grizzled old guy called Jack Leary. Uh, you're working on the surface of Mars. You have a partner called Jessica Appleton, and the two of you are a little mechanic unit. You will drive around in your big um, articulated vehicle with its big space tracks for getting over this rocky surface. Um, and you will drive between um, installations to perform routine maintenance, to perform standard repairs. There are lots of storms on Mars. The weather is fierce. The rocks are thrown around. The sand gets into everything. And so you two have to go around and fix things. You have to fix communications arrays. You have to fix all kinds of stuff. And that's where the game begins. Um, Jessica is on um, abseiled up a big mast and she's fixing that. You're talking um, across the intercom. So you hear her voice in your ear. Um, but as you are doing this routine repair, a call comes in, a distress call from a nearby scientific station called Fort Solace. It's an old installation. Uh, people don't really know what's up there. It seems like Mars has got like a frontier vibe to it. There are different companies there are different buildings, there are different factories, there are different mining operations. Fort Solis is one such place. Um, as Jack, you go over to the communications array, you try and find out why the station is on lockdown, uh, why it has put out a distress call, a manual distress call, so not a false alarm. 
And when Jack can't raise anyone to query what's going on at the station, he decides to hop in the big Mars car and crawl over there. Um, so this opening section quickly revealed what would be the strengths and weaknesses of the game, I would say. Um, straight away, you notice that this game looks incredible. The facial animations are beautiful. The lighting is intense. Uh, the weather effects are really cool. You've got all this red dust blowing over everything. The lighting looks amazing. It's so atmospheric. It feels like a wild outback. Um, but as you are walking around as Jack, you will try every button to see if you can make him run or jog or walk faster. Uh, you cannot. He is going to be walking at a snail's pace. It's the curse of Arthur Morgan back again. I think even Arthur has like a, a bulky little jog. Um, Jack Leary does not. You're, so you have to quickly reconcile yourself when playing Fort Solace with the fact that you are slowed to a crawl um, and you're just going to have to ease into that. It was definitely one of those games, one of those moments at the start of a game, you know, when you go, oh no. A little bit like Starfield with the space travel just now. Um, but at the same time, it looks fantastic. The voice acting is amazing. There are believable uh, repartee between Jessica and Jack. Um, so I was up for the story, you know. Um, and as Jack drives over to Fort Solace, there is a cinematic driving sequences with opening credits, like a sci-fi movie. You see this heavy vehicle crawling down um, a, a loosely marked trail with flashing lights on either side of it, like a runway. Uh, the camera pans out and you see the hulking structure of Fort Solis on the horizon. You see the track marked over the red sand by giant tire marks and lined with flashing lights like cat's eyes. Just awesome to look at. The camera zooms out um, and you get that title card. And I was like, yeah, this is great. I can't wait for the rest of this experience. Um, and that atmosphere stays solid as the game proper begins after that little prelude and that little story setup. Um, you will quickly find that this station is oddly deserted. There is no welcome party. There is no security officer who Jack is expecting to see. And you have to find your way in. That's the first order of business. Uh, so you can walk around the, the exterior. There is a storm coming in. So Jack is quite keen to get inside. He decides not to cut the door open which he could do, so he leaves his tools in the car and decides to take a pacifist approach and not wreck the station, maybe get an insurance claim against him or something. Um, so you have to find your way in, and it does become apparent here that the gameplay is not going to be a strong suit. It has that slow walk speed. Um, it also has cumbersome controls. The turning doesn't feel particularly good. It's quite stiff. It's quite slow. Um, which can get annoying, especially when you're in confined spaces and you want to turn and look at a computer. It just feels bulky. It feels like there's an obstacle between what you're doing on the controller and what your character is doing on the screen. Um, it really made me miss the controls of The Last of Us. You know the way that um, Naughty Dog controls work, where you can kind of strafe as you are moving. Um, Joel has like a bulky little run. Um, you can move left and right whilst looking in ahead of you. So you can kind of turn, um, but be looking in a different direction. It's very fluid and cool. Kind of unusual, actually. I remember thinking when I played The Last of Us that the controls were quite an ingenious way to solve movement. Um, that's strafing as you walk. Um, that's not present here. You just have to walk in a direction. You look that way. That's just how it is. Um, it doesn't feel good. So the gameplay doesn't feel good in any um, aspect. Um, I'm on the record as thinking that movement's really important for having a good game experience, it's bad here. It's just how it is. Um, it's been a universal sticking point in reviews as well, so much so that the developers have responded on Steam to people saying the walk speed is too slow. Um, they did this slightly defensive and um, garbled Steam post. Um, a bit of a frustrating answer, actually. They said it's intentional, which we know, but that still doesn't mean it's good. Um, they said they're thinking of adding um, a run in outdoor scenes only, which is not much of the game, honestly. You're mostly walking down these long interior corridors. That's where it's frustrating, especially when urgent events are taking place and your character can't even jog. So even if it is an intentional, intentionally slow speed that is designed to make you plod through the game at a deliberate narrative pace, um, it definitely impacts the experience, especially as the playtime wears on. Um, sometimes you have to backtrack through environments and they are beautiful the first time you see them and you don't mind walking slow, but on the third time, you've seen it already. It's just wasting your time. So there is a feeling of everything taking too long in the game. I think you are going to have to be patient with this game uh, to enjoy it. 
But the opening section also shows the game's great strengths, and they are considerable. I really want to make sure that um, I flag those strengths too, because a lot of people are focused on the negatives here. Um, and I was very fascinated by what I was seeing right from the first scene. Um, as Jack gets into Fort Solis and he starts looking around the interior, um, it works so well. Like he takes off his helmet, he looks around, he doesn't feel threatened. Like we as the player might know that something is wrong and some, you know, a dramatic story is going to unfold. We have that feeling of unease. We know that something's not right here. To him, it's just a routine call. So he's very casual about it. He walks around, he makes comments about the state of this station. He hasn't been in here before. He notices old machinery that gives him a feeling of nostalgia, which is something that I love in games, especially sci-fi. When you see stuff that looks futuristic to you, but the character in the game is from far future and thinks of it as antique, that is just something that I always love in a game. It makes the world feel real, um, like it's on a timeline. Um, so that really worked. I loved looking around the inside of Fort Solace. There are flickering screens everywhere, projections, plants, uh, drinks dispensers. It's immersive, it's detailed, the lighting is good. Um, you get this sense of it being abandoned, um, of it, people should be here and they're not. You can see signs of them everywhere you look. It's like, um, you know, the film Alien, the crew quarters, where there's just a lot going on. It's rough and tumble, half-eaten meals, items of clothing. It's a human space. Um, Fort Solace feels like that. And I think that narratively and in terms of environmental design, um, this game does a wonderful job of creating a memorable, interesting, immersive space to walk around. Um, the flickering, lonely electrical lights, the wind-whipped railings of the outside, um, the locked door that he tries first, he looks, peeks down, he sees the empty hallway stretching out. There's a feeling of unease, a feeling of fascination with this place. What is this place? It really brought out my curiosity. I think it's an audiovisual powerhouse of a game, uh, very, very immersive when it's firing on all cylinders. And the voice acting stands out too in the early stages. Jack is constantly chatting with Jessica over the comms. Um, it's Firewatch-esque, I would say. There are jokes, they have chemistry. He's the grumpy old guy and she's almost like the, the teen daughter or something, that's their dynamic. Um, and this situation is ostensibly routine, but the tension is already starting to build at this point in a really satisfying way. And you start heading deeper into the station. You have to find key cards. You have to do those minimal gameplay things that I talked about. Find passwords to unlock a computer. You start to read emails. You start to see video logs. The characters are introduced one at a time as you find their offices and as you get deeper into the station. And as you get further in, it becomes more and more apparent that something is not right. I'm not going to spoil the twists and stories and things like that. But Jack does find a pool of blood it's apparent that something bad has happened here. And he tries to keep the atmosphere light when talking to Jessica, because he knows that she'll flip out and come for him straight away, um, which I thought was a really cool little um, piece of narrative there as well. Like, he cares about her. He doesn't want her to come. He wants to know that it's safe for her to come before he tells her what's going on. So there's one part of you that's wishing he would tell her, and there's another part that gets his fatherly instinct and I really enjoy, I think this was maybe my favourite part of the game, honestly, the slowness of this stuff, of like uh, creeping further into the station. Um, I really enjoyed this, this gathering tension. And this was the entire first hour and a half, I think, the first act of the game. And then, of course, there is an event that, that makes everything become clear, or at least a little bit clearer. Um, that's when the thriller aspect of this, the, the suspense breaks, and there is a, like a cool event and you move on to the next chapter. Every time you get to a new chapter, it flashes up on the screen in big letters, chapter two, and they're all named. Um, and I'm going to leave the the beat-by-beat beat, um, narrative description of what happens in the game there, actually, and just move on to some mechanical stuff, because I don't want to spoil it for you. I think that the real draw of this game is the suspense and is the discovery of what's going on. But I think it's safe to say it's, it's not a monster movie, you know? It's more of a, um, a space suspense film, um, film, you see, I said film, like a cinematic, uh, filmic game, um, more than a space horror. You're not going to end up like, you know, with a predator running around inside or anything. It's more of a human horror story. Um, and as such, it felt almost like a play. 
I did enjoy this, um, the way it uses the mechanics of the game, um, of finding logs, finding videos, um, of discovering story things, feeling like you're an active player, feeling like you are untangling a mystery through exploration. Um, and as you walk around, you can see the, uh, the lived-in space. There's a pool table. You can hit a ball. You know, he will comment on the music that's playing or things like that. He'll comment on what kind of food they have. And so you're exploring. You feel like a participant, but you're also starting to unravel the mystery. And as I have said, immediately after playing, I did go and look at some explainer videos to figure out the plot holes. Um, I didn't feel like I had a sense of closure in the story. So in terms of how the story is told across the entirety of the game and its success, um, I think that you have to be a completionist in this game if you want to get every clue. I think even if you do get every clue, when you are reading like 20 to 30 to 40 different messages and watching tens of video logs, you do glaze over just a touch, um, and you can't afford to do that if you want to understand this story. Um, each one has clues in it, and you really need to be attentive. I think my advice to a player in this game would be to treat it like a detective game almost. Look for the facial expressions, look for interpersonal conflict, look for um, the hidden meaning in seemingly mundane events that someone has reported, because you're going to need all of that if you want to really, really um, work out what happened at Fort Solace. I did not play that way, and so I was left at a bit of a loose end after I finished it. Um, I felt like there was a lot open to interpretation. There was a lot of ambiguous, fragmented information that I had not slotted together. And I think that might be because the story doesn't seem to convey some key info. It doesn't signpost it heavily. It's not crisp, it's not thrust in front of you. Like the chronology of events of what has happened on Fort Solace, the characters' motivations, and just the hard facts of the case, really. Um, they can be a little vague and loosey-goosey. You do have to figure it out yourself and put the pieces together. There are some leaps, some logical leaps that you're going to have to make between one event and what ultimately seems to have gone down. Um, so I was initially pretty disappointed after the game, but in the weeks since I played it, I've been thinking about it more. Um, the game does tell an interesting human story, um, and it is an attempt to do that through a game. And um, That intersection is perhaps not entirely successful, um, but what's there is good. All of the ingredients are there. Um, I think this game gets halfway. Um, it, maybe it takes cues more from art movies than from sci-fi blockbusters in a way. Um, I think about mainstream sci-fi, and this story doesn't serve you up the plot like a mainstream sci-fi movie would. There is a little bit of dissonance here uh, between the narrative delivery mechanism and what I was at least expecting based on how the game looked and felt and presented itself. Um, but there are some sci-fi movies that are like that, you know, like the Ad Astras, the Arrivals, and to a degree something like Interstellar. Um, I think that all three of those movies would have been better if they had pared down their runtime, if they had concentrated on delivering the, the spine and the core of the story, rather than the sort of fluffy edges and the moody moments. Um, if they got off their conceptual high horse just a little, lose a bit of the fluff and tell a lean, concise story. Um, but I think that this is a matter of taste, and if you do like those vague, um, films that invite you into them to think about them, talk about them more, then this this might this might appeal to you. Fort Solace is very much one of those, I think. So to run through some of the the highlights and lowlights of this game, um, the graphics in this game are incredible. The fidelity is beautiful. It looks like a next-gen title. Um, the detail of the environments, the lighting, the art design, the feeling of the sense of place, like the, the signage in-game, the computers that people use, the ephemera that they have around their offices. It feels lived in. It feels heavy, real. Um, you feel very far away from the world. The atmosphere is just amazing. Um, I love the lived-in feeling of Fort Solace itself and the believability of all the tech that you will find. It's a fully realized world. Um, the sound design is also excellent, and I really enjoyed the music. Um, the scenario is good, the voice acting is good, the characters are good, I enjoyed the writing. Um, the pacing in the first half was incredible, actually. It's slow, deliberate, suspenseful. Um, and I became very invested in the story, enough to buy the game from the trial. Um, as the story progresses, it opens up some interesting themes that I'm not going to spoil. Um, but where it really shines is the presentation. 
um, and that really strong opening, it doesn't quite follow through, I would say, narratively or in terms of gameplay. But if you like the idea of exploring a beautiful science fiction world with a slightly vague story and piecing it together yourself, then that is definitely what you get here. Um, as for the bad stuff, the movement is awful. It just feels terrible. It's such a big oversight um, and it really does almost tank the game. I think for some people it does tank the game. It's a big problem. Um, there are QTEs in this game. Um, if you've been listening for a long time, you'll know that QTEs are one of my gaming nemeses. I cannot stand them. Um, I think it's a cheap form of gameplay. Um, and even good QTEs are boring. Like, in Final Fantasy, sometimes you have to hit buttons in boss battles to trigger giant attacks. That feels kind of cool and it's fine. Um, here, they are egregiously bad. The window is too short. There are too many inputs. By the time you've clocked an input and thought about which button you're going to press, you failed the QTE. And most egregiously of all, um, if you fail QTEs, I went onto YouTube to see what happened if I had passed them, and the answer is nothing. The story plays out exactly the same. So not only are they frustrating and badly done in this game, but they are also uh, pointless completely. I would be happy if I never had to play another QTE again, and the ones in Fort Solace are some of the worst that I've seen. Um, I would also critique the story progression. After all of that excellent work in the setup of drawing the player in, I felt like it did come apart in the second half. Um, the plot gets confusing where it should open up. I think it um, expects the player to notice uh, minutiae or subtle cues that are perhaps a little too subtle. I was playing this game pretty attentively, and was quite into it. And there are moments that just went over my head, uh, where there's one person posing as another person, for example. There were so many names coming so thick and fast, it didn't occur to me that was the case, so I just missed it. Um, and I felt that some major plot cues were delivered in a way that made them feel too subtle, too small. They were de-emphasised. Um, I think that I could have used a little more help. I could have used a little more direction from the narrative and less... Um, they left a lot of space here, they left a lot of subtlety here, and I think that that comes at a cost of narrative cohesion. Um, I am a fairly attentive player, and I do feel that if I couldn't put this plot together, then a lot of other people might struggle with the same things. It did mean that some of the, uh, the key clues and the key facts of what has happened in Fort Solace passed me by a little bit. I felt like there were holes in some of the characters' arcs. You know, as we do learn what they did during the time at Fort Solace that has immediately preceded your arrival, some of them seem to make jumps that didn't quite make sense to me. Um, like logical jumps or behavioural jumps that the story didn't quite justify. So I was left thinking, well, I know kind of what went down, but I don't know why. Like what made these people do the things they did? Um, what made these events unfold the way they did? You know, what? how does it all tie together? Um, and it may be that I just missed key information, but after watching the uh, the unwrap videos that I checked out on YouTube, um, there was still even even these kind of you know extremely pedantic um, type of story narrative viewers and players that make these videos, which who I really appreciate. Even they said they had to make some jumps of logic, having combed every log and rewatched every video to actually piece together what happened. So I think it is ultimately just a little too vague as a story. There were a couple of other things, a couple of bugs. Um, the UI is broken. Um, on the pause screen, you can't see what you're selecting. Strange. Um, strange tiny bug in such a big, ambitious game. Um, the map is bad. It doesn't show player position or orientation, um, so you, you end up getting lost and meandering around a little too much. It lacks that basic GPS utility that we're all used to in current technology in our iPhones and Android phones, um, surely in the future they can see them at position on a map. Um, there were a couple of bugs with audio not turning off where I had to um, save, close the game, reopen the game. Um, one of them was a, a beeping device that would just beep for the rest of the game. So little audio bugs um, that bothered me a little as well, but for the most part, pretty clean. So in conclusion, I've got mixed feelings about this game. I'm glad that I saw this world and I will remember it positively for the mood, for the tension, for the environment, I like thinking back to these characters. I'm still thinking about the story and going over it in my head. Um, the gameplay, though, is woeful, um, and the story execution is iffy, but it's a small team making their first game. Um, the game is £25 for a four-hour experience that is 
worth experiencing, I would say. If, if any of this sounds intriguing to you, then do check it out, especially when it goes on to half price sale, I'm guessing in a few months. Um, I don't think this one has punched through in the way that they might hope, considering how good it looks. But I don't know. For a small team making their first game, maybe this is good enough. This is ambitious. They've made something notable, for sure. And it's a game that I'm still thinking about, which I think says a lot. Um, So even if some of the execution didn't fully land with me, I'm very glad that I played Fort Solace. that was Fort Solace. I hope you enjoyed that review. Um, I'm going to knock this podcast on the head and get myself back to Starfield. I can't wait to dive in and play some more. Um, I'm excited to have Sea of Stars as well. So if I've got Starfield going on and I've got Sea of Stars on the side, that's a nice pair of games to have for two different moods. Um, I'll be talking about both of those games in the future. Um, If you've played Fort Solace, if you're playing Sea of Stars, if you're playing Starfield, um, you can let me know what you think. You can find me at Gaming in the Wild on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. Um, I'm also on Blue Sky at Gaming in the Wild. I prefer that to Twitter, given the state that Twitter is in. Um, thanks very much for listening, and thanks very much to everyone that leaves a rating on the show, leaves a review, and especially who becomes a patron. If you would like to do so, you can do so at patreon.com slash gaming in the wild. Come chat to me and the other patrons in the Discord. It's a great time. Yeah, so that's it for this week. Thanks very much for listening. Take care of yourselves and each other, and bye-bye for now.